Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kanika Mahajan, and I'm an MPhil candidate at the Center of Development Studies. Today, I will be speaking about the issue of violence against women in India, providing a general overview of two broad themes. First, the prevalence of such violence, and second, the barriers that survivors face in accessing justice. So in India, despite the existence of various constitutional and legal guarantees of gender equality, structural inequality of women continues to be prevalent across the country, with patriarchal attitudes deeply entrenched into almost all institutions of the state and society. One of the most pernicious ways in which this gender inequality is manifested is the epidemic of violence against women. So as for the United Nations, violence against women is defined as any act of gender-based violence that results in or is likely to result in the physical, sexual, or mental harm or suffering of women. Such violence is rooted in and further perpetuates gender inequalities. As per Dr. Simon Kumar, an academic working on the issue, violence against women is such a common phenomena in India that the state and citizens have actually become inured to even the most horrendous stories of violations. A cursory glance at official government data reveals the gravity of the situation in the country. In 2019 itself, over 400,000 cases of crimes against women were registered, marking a 7.3% rise from the previous year. These cases included over 125,000 instances of cruelty by husband or his relatives, over 32,000 cases of rape, over 7,000 cases of dowry deaths, 283 of murder with rape or gang rape, and 150 incidences of acid attacks. There are also many other crimes that are included in this category, such as kidnapping, trafficking, cyber crimes, and so on. This magnitude and pervasiveness of the issue, which pervades both public and private spheres in the country, led the Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women in a 2014 report to conclude that women in India are exposed to a continuum of violence from the womb to the tomb. It is also widely acknowledged that while these numbers are terrifyingly high, they may actually reflect just the tip of the iceberg because only a small proportion of women actually report complaints owing to various factors such as social stigma, the pressure to uphold familial honor, lack of faith in the legal processes, and fear of retaliation and further violence. So while this victimhood narrative has often dominated the discourse of violence against women in India, what is, over, what is often overlooked is that women themselves have been at the forefront of catalyzing change by collectivizing, organizing, and protesting, be it against the inadequate state response to violence or demanding legal reform and holding perpetrators accountable. For instance, the current domestic violence law in the country, which was passed by the Indian Parliament in 2005, was a direct consequence of sustained campaigning by women's rights groups since the 1970s. However, even though there are these established legal frameworks that prohibit and penalize violence against women, there exists a major chasm between what the legal system promises and what it actually delivers. The legal system in India is plagued with issues relating to the overburdening of courts, high levels of backlogs and delays in judicial processes, as well as extremely low rates of convictions in cases of violence against women. For instance, in 2019, the pendency of court cases relating to rape was 89.5%, cruelty by husband or his relatives was 91.7%, and the pendency of court cases relating to acid attacks was as high as 94.3%. Survivors are often also subjected to re-victimization by various institutional stakeholders, which has a significant bearing on the fairness of the justice process and its outcomes. In cases of domestic violence, for instance, Police, judges, and prosecutors often perpetuate the notion that domestic violence is a private or familial matter that should be shrouded in secrecy and shame. This manifests in various ways, including the police's refusal or reluctance to lodge complaints or their diversion of complainants to mediation services that often result in forced reconciliations. Judges, too, often echo similar sentiments, relying on traditional arguments of gender roles within the family and prioritizing the sanctity of the marriage or the familial unit over the concerns of the survivor's safety. Another prominent issue is the inadequacy of support structures for survivors such as protection services or psychological counseling. To illustrate, in 2019, a study was conducted by Jagori, a prominent Indian feminist organization across five states on the support services that are mandated by the Indian domestic violence law. The study found that not only are the number of support services such as shelter homes insufficient in the country, but they're also inadequately and irregularly funded, 
which has led to poor infrastructure and a lack of mental health care services in these shelter homes, forcing women in these shelter homes to live in terribly dismal conditions. In addition to their paucity, support services are also unevenly distributed across the country, being highly concentrated in urban areas and sparsely spread or even absent in certain rural areas. It is also important to emphasize here that women in India are not a homogeneous category and that gender-based discrimination is compounded by other forms of discrimination based on caste, class, religion, sexual orientation and gender identity, and disability. Women who face such intersecting forms of oppression may not only be more vulnerable to violence, but they also face exasperated barriers in accessing justice. To cite just a few examples, the support services for survivors such as shelter homes are often not inclusive of queer and gender non-conforming individuals. Women from marginalized castes are often subjected to caste-based discrimination by police and other law enforcement authorities. And in many cases, perpetrators of crime Im enjoy impunity on the basis of their caste, class, or religious identity privilege. To cite a recent relevant example, in September 2020, protests erupted across the country over the gang rape and consequent death of a 19-year-old Dalit woman by four upper caste men in Hathras district of Uttar Pradesh. This was followed by some blatant procedural lapses in the investigation by the local police authorities, including the forceful cremation of the victim's body without the knowledge or consent of the family, which prevented the family from performing the customary last rites of the victim. And so, survivors in India are confronted with systemic barriers at each step of the justice chain, ultimately forcing many of them to continue living in hostile and violent environments. The failure of the state to adequately address such violence and hold perpetrators accountable creates this virtuous cycle wherein violence continues to occur, it becomes more and more normalized and a culture of impunity is created. And while there is no quick and easy answer to ending such violence, the Indian state must start by addressing the lacunae in its justice systems to ensure that the law's protections do not exist merely on paper. And since this violence and unequal access to justice is a direct consequence of the social, economic, and political marginalization of certain groups. Sustained efforts are needed right from the grassroots to the top echelons of governance to ensure that patriarchal privilege, power, and impunity are systematically dismantled, along with these other forms of intersecting oppressions that I have mentioned. That is my general overview of the issue, and I'd be happy to take any questions about the topic in the Q&A later. Thank you.